Welcome, everyone. Glad to have you here with us today for our, I believe it's our 81st episode of This is CDR. This is CDR is an online event series presented by Open Air to uh, contextualize carbon removal. Um, the carbon removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals that Open Air seeks to advance at every level of government here in the U.S., as well as in national and subnational jurisdictions globally. My name is Toby Bryce. I work on policy advocacy and market development for Open Air, and I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. If you haven't done so already, please uh, say hello, introduce yourself in the chat, tell us where you're zooming in from, your affiliation if you'd like, and um, also please direct that message to everyone and not just host and panelists. Um, there's a little toggle there in the Zoom chat. Um, so everyone can hear from you. If you're not familiar with Open Air, um, we are an all-volunteer organization dedicated to the responsible advancement of carbon removal. Um, we are a global community. We work together on shared open source projects that we call missions in the areas of policy, innovation, communications, and activist market development. Um, here's a graphical representation of the few couple dozen active projects we're working on. Um, uh, uh, my guest co-host today, Irene, is going to be running the chat, and she's put a bunch of links in there to our website into a forum where you can um, join our group and um, we'd love to have you be a part of what we're doing. As always, we like to define our terms uh, before we get started with the program. Um, this is a definition of CDR from a great resource called the CDR Primer, which is a, a textbook that you can read online and also purchase a hard copy of, which I encourage you to do so. Um, CDR is purposeful human activity to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs, which we're going to talk about today, or in long-lived products. Um, this is also essentially the same definition that the IPCC uses. We think it's a great one to work with, um, and it's really, again, important to um, define what carbon removal is, the atmospheric function, and differentiate it with other terms like carbon capture and CCS, which mean different things and which are often conflated in the media and elsewhere with carbon removal. One really important thing to call out up front whenever we talk about carbon removal is that carbon removal, while it's essential for solving the climate crisis, it's in no way, shape, or form any sort of substitute or uh, excuse to decelerate rapid decarbonization of the global economy and reducing a uh, complete reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. 90% um, of our climate work plus needs to be reducing emissions. If we don't do that, the final mile of carbon removal will not serve any purpose because we will be in a very bad place. That said, um, there's clear scientific consensus from the IPCC and elsewhere that carbon removal will be necessary at gigaton scale, billions of tons per year by mid-century, to neutralize what are called our residual emissions. Those are the emissions that we can't reduce in a climate relevant relevant time frame um, and reach net zero. Um, in the second half of the century, we're going to need carbon removal to start drawing down the probably at that point upwards of 2 trillion tons of anthropogenic CO2 in the atmosphere um, to restore the climate to a safer place. We can already see that the climate is becoming unsafe. So, you know, carbon removal has a couple jobs to do um, and we need to start scaling it now. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my co-host, Irene, who is going to talk a little bit about run of show and um, introduce today's presenter. Great. Thanks, Toby. Hi, everyone. My name is Irene Polony, and I'm an open air advocate based in Brooklyn, New York. And I also work on ocean alkalinity enhancement R&D. Some housekeeping notes before we begin. Our format will be a short presentation, followed by a few prepared questions by Toby, and then I will moderate an audience Q&A. If you have a question while Matt is presenting, uh, please type your questions into the Zoom's Q&A box as we go along, not in the chat. This helps us stay more organized. Also, this event is being recorded. We'll send the video link to everyone who registered as well as post it to Open Air's website and YouTube channel. All right, this week we're pleased to welcome Seaworthy co-founder and executive director, Dr. Matthew Long, to discuss the new organization's vital mission to build software that supports multi-scale oceanographic modeling and data integration for quantifying the efficacy and ecological impact of marine CDR. Matthew Long co-founded Seaworthy in 2022 with Alicia Karspeck and David Ho. Prior to Seaworthy, Matt was a scientist in the oceanographic section of the Climate and Global Dynamics Laboratory at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, where he conducted research related to the carbon cycle, ocean biogeochemistry, and marine ecosystems in the context of climate variability and change. Matt holds master's and bachelor's degrees in civil and environmental engineering from Tufts University and a PhD in oceanography from Stanford. And now for the main event. 
Go ahead, Matt, take it away. Thanks, Irene. Thanks, Toby. Uh, just going to share my screen. Okay. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to speak today. I'm going to talk to you about um, what we're up to at, at, at Seaworthy and um, look forward to uh, engaging in the discussion after the presentation. Um, here are the key points of my talk. As Toby highlighted at the beginning, um, CDR is required to keep global temperatures below the thresholds uh, specified by the Paris Agreement. Um, Ocean-based CDR has the potential to yield climate-relevant uh, removals, um, but a functioning carbon market requires uh, tools for monitoring, reporting, and verification to ensure that CDR is operating as expected. Um, MRV, uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification, in the ocean is very challenging. Um, in part because of natural variability, carbonate chemistry, which makes gas exchange very slow, and then ocean circulation and mixing that distribute the signals of CDR over large spatiotemporal regions. Um, at Seaworthy, we're building software systems built on top of oceanographic models to confront these challenges. Um, just to back up to the very beginning here, um, it's worth just highlighting for those not familiar that um, the the requirement for uh, carbon dioxide removal stems really from the fact that the change in Earth's climate is roughly linearly proportional to cumulative emissions. This is actually a pretty remarkable feature of the Earth's system. Um, but what it implies is that we have a finite term carbon budget. And so uh, over the next um, uh, the, the amount of CO2 we can, can emit, um, given this uh, relationship of surface warming to cumulative emissions, implies that to meet a 1.5 degree target, we only have another 210 uh, gigatons of CO2 to emit. Um, and that at 22, 2022 emissions is only about five years of, of time. Um, the reason CDR is required is because the rate at which um, we can conceivably in, uh, reduce emissions is just impractically fast. And the amount of CDR that's required is very large. This figure is from a paper um, in 2018 that shows on the left, the uh, global carbon budget as a function of time with the land and atmosphere um, and ocean sinks um, uh, for, for anthropogenic CO2. And then on the right, two bars representing the amount of CDR that's like uh, expected to be required by 2050 and then 2100. So by 2050, the expectation is a requirement of order 10 gigatons of removal, and that's commensurate with the current magnitude of the ocean, the global ocean sink for, anth for anthropogenic CO2. Um, by the end of the century, we expect that number to be closer to 20 gigatons, and that's roughly double the current magnitude of the oceans, the global ocean sink. So these are very large numbers. Um, the ocean will comprise an important role uh, in the portfolio of carbon dioxide removal. Um, it already absorbs one quarter of the emissions, and it is the largest carbon reservoir, um, storing uh, currently roughly 38,000 petagrams of carbon, not CO2, but carbon, um, as the largest dynamic uh, reservoir of active uh, carbon on, on the planet. Um, there are various technologies that have been proposed for ocean carbon dioxide removal. Um, some include nutrient fertilization to stimulate natural to stimulate phytoplankton blooms at the surface and generate uh, sinking organic matter. Seaweed farming is a another biotic method that generates uh, biomass at the surface that can subsequently be harvested and and sunk to depth. Um, and ocean alkalinity enhancement. Um, uh, which increases the buffer capacity of seawater, thereby changing the ocean's capacity to store CO2 um, in chemical forms. Um, notably, there is growing investment in this space. Frontier is a roughly $1 billion uh, pre-purchase market um, commitment to buy CDR. Um, and there's a lot of companies, CDR companies, spinning up uh, that want to deploy technologies uh, to remove carbon via ocean CDR methods. A key missing link in the value chains that might support um, an ocean CDR industry is the technology required for quantification. 
And that's where Seaworthy comes in. So our mission is to build scientifically supported software to quantify the efficacy of ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. And I'm illustrating um, the various organizations here that have thus far provided um, funding to Seaworthy. Um, we are convening or, or organizing ourselves um, in, uh, in a new model of, um, uh, called a focused research organization. And this model tries to blend together some of the advantages of a, of a large scale corporate effort, um, a, a, a tightly coordinated team exemplified by a typical startup company, and the depth of uh, research experience um, that exists in the academic sphere. Um, uh, this FRO model seeks to maximize the, um, the, the advantages of each of these categories. Um, and FRO is characterized by a, a full-time founding team, um, a relatively large effort. Um, we anticipate having roughly 30 people or more on staff at Seaworthy. Um, and we will work to produce high impact public goods. Our efforts will be entirely in the public domain. Um, we are conceiving of Seaworthy as a finite effort, finite duration effort, scoping the project to last for about five to seven years. During that time, we will uh, identify an exit strategy that entails actively translating the technology we build into either venture-backed startups or longer-lived nonprofit entities um, associated with the CDR industry. So at a very high level, what will see, uh, see where these tools do? We will track uh, CDR signals within the ocean flow, provide quantitative estimates of CDR relative to baselines, um, return estimates of additionality and storage durability, support scientifically credible uh, methods for validation that are fully transparent and documented, and then provide efficient, cost-effective, and easy to deploy computational workflows that enable CDR companies and verifiers to, uh, to conduct the type of, uh, to answer the type of questions that require ocean analysis. Okay, so just backing up a second, why is ocean CDR quantification so challenging? Well, one reason is that the baselines are complicated. Another reason is that the, 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 the signals associated with ocean CDR manifest over very large spatiotemporal scales. Uh, CO2 gas equilibration is slow and CDR does not happen until carbon is transferred from the atmosphere into the ocean. Um, the signal to noise ratios are unfavorable. The magnitude of uh, perturbations in ocean carbon fields induced by CDR deployments are very small relative to the magnitude of the mean uh, quantities like dissolved inorganic carbon and relative to the uh, variability in those quantities. And then finally, um, there's concern about uh, ecosystem compensation response or feedback in the ocean ecosystem that might serve to uh, diminish the efficacy of CDR impacts. So just an illustration of this complex baseline issue, I mentioned earlier that the, the CDR occurs via an exchange from the atmosphere, exchange of CO2 from the atmosphere into the ocean. And here's a, a, an animation from an integration that we conducted at NCAR. This is a global one-tenth of a degree ocean model with a fully explicit three-dimensional circulation field. Embedded in that field is an ocean ecosystem and biogeochemistry model that represents the processes um, sustaining the ocean carbon inventory. And what you see in this, uh, this animation of the air-sea flux field is a highly dynamic, um, uh, highly variable uh, field that has large scale spatial patterns. For instance, the outgassing um, of carbon along the equator and the uptake at high latitudes, those patterns are associated with the large scale overturning circulation. Superimposed on that pattern is a mesoscale rich and eddy and eddy uh, mesoscale rich field of variability mediated by by um, the eddying turbulent flow of the ocean. And then you see patterns associated with atmospheric variability as synoptic storm systems um, move over the North Pacific, for example, and drive um, substantial uptake that's varying as a function of the wind speed. So this is the nature of the baseline counterfactual that needs to be uh, that against which CDR additionality needs to be evaluated. 
Another issue is relates to the role of ocean circulation and its capacity to distribute signals over very large spatial and temporal regions. This is an animation from a region um, in the equatorial Pacific. It's a, um, a very high resolution, 124th degree configuration of the MOM6 ocean model. And what we've done is induced a continuous dye tracer source in um, the uh, right-hand side of the domain here, and then represented the uh, transport of that dye under flow. You notice that there's a clock in the upper right-hand corner illustrating the time domain. And so over a period of about six months, this dye tracer has just been distributed over scales of order thousands of kilometers. And its pattern, it, the distribution is predicated on the turbulent dynamics of the flow in this region. That dye tracer movie was actually a little bit misleading because I plotted it on something like a log scale in order to highlight um, the effect. And then also the dye tracer itself is a quantity uh, referenced to a background field of zero. In the case of ocean CDR, the, a more realistic picture is shown on the right here, where we've added back in a background field that's commensurate with the magnitude of the dye tracer itself. And this is the kind of needle in the haystack phenomena that a analytical uh, instrument will have to search for um, when looking for the signal of an ocean CDR um, uh, intervention in ocean chemical uh, fields. So those challenges imply that a fully uh, observationally based approach to ocean CDR is really not a viable strategy for a robust framework for measurement reporting and verification. Rather, what we need is a combination of uh, the best available theory as it is enshrined in oceanographic models. Those models provide a capacity to simulate the dynamics of physical and bio biogeochemical uh, processes in the ocean, and there, and and when combined with uh, observations, thereby provide a framework for detection and attribution of ocean CDR signals. The system we envision building at Seaworthy is illustrated here. It's called Sea Star, and at the core of this system are oceanographic models, general circulation models that are coupled with. Uh, uh, process modules that represent ocean biogeochemistry, seaweed cultivation, other ecosystem dynamics, and perhaps uh, idealized uh, tracers. That uh, ocean general circulation model, the oceanographic model, is coupled with the data assimilation framework to ensure that it is consistent um, with the trajectory of the system through state space. Um, and then there is the possibility of uh, uh, pairing this explicit forward modeling capacity with statistical um, machine learning or data-driven models to develop appropriate approximations. This system um, can be run in ensemble mode to generate representations of uncertainty, and ultimately will return estimates of the ocean state under the perturbed condition and a control condition representative of a baseline counterfactual. The difference between these two states provides a capacity to estimate additionality. Notably, many elements of this system exist in the public domain in the research, the academic research sphere and oceanographic um, and climate modeling communities, but they are not tools that are readily amenable to uh, deploy to applying to ocean CDR problems. And so we envision um, building utilities that wrap these tools under user interfaces that enable uh, various workflows to deploy um, deploy and compute, as well as uh, perform model validation tasks, and then supported applications like conducting measurement reporting and verification or observing system simulation experiments. Notably, the CDR problem is intrinsically multi-scale, and so there's a requirement uh, to support multi-scale modeling in this framework. We have a core belief at Seaworthy that um, modeling tools such as CSTAR provide a capacity to develop consensus that extends beyond just sort of sitting in the room and talking about things or writing reports, but rather a low friction effective tool provides a center of, center of gravity for a collaborative uh, community and in and of itself provides a framework to codify the consensus um, of that community and establish best practices. So our approach 
will inherently be community oriented. It's worth noting that this uh, approach is um, uh, presents the requirement of a lot of a computation and computation uh, yields a challenging problem in the sense that it's expensive to compute. And the more uh, complexity or uh, resolution or a uh, number of ensembles that you want to add to your modeling system incurs additional costs in terms of computation and the amount of data that is generated. And so this motivates us to seek ways to reduce the computational cost of our, of our models and find alternative methods. At the end of the day, we seek to develop practical targets for MRV systems. And I've listed some of the targets here. The method, the MRV should be good enough. That is to say that it's scientifically credible um, and it returns estimates of net carbon removal with associated uncertainties. Um, decision support systems need to be fast enough so that um, companies can make decisions about deployments and the cost um, and, 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 um, and answers are returned in reasonable timeframes. It needs to be cheap enough such that the carbon market can bear the cost of MRV. Diverse enough, viable approaches to CDR need to be supported. Safe enough, the, uh, the uh, impact of CDR deployments on ocean ecosystems needs to be able, we need to be able to evaluate that, that impact um, to within the bounds of scientific understanding. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, getting better, that our under, current understanding of the ocean carbon system now bears uh, significant uncertainty and, and gaps. And we envision a community-oriented framework that can evolve with the cutting edge of science. Okay, just in the final portion of the talk here, I'd like to just walk you through uh, a very quick example um, of how we're thinking about uh, the evolution of an MRV system. This is based on ocean alkalinity enhancement. So the way ocean alkalinity enhancement works is that an alkalinity input to the surface mixed layer um, drives a perturbation in the surface ocean partial pressure of CO2. It, it reduces that partial pressure and then induces a gas exchange. Um, thermodynamic constraints suggest that the, uh, the equilibrated uh, carbon uptake associated with an alkalinity addition should be in the range of about 0.7 to 0.9. It varies geographically um, with higher ratios at, at higher latitudes and low ratios in the tropics. However, um, the, the gas exchange associated with ocean alkalinity enhancement does not occur instantaneously. Rather, it occurs as the parcel of alkalinity enhanced water transits the surface ocean. And so the time scale over which that water is exposed to the atmosphere and allowed to exchange the properties with the, with the atmosphere um, is a key determinant of the total efficiency of ocean alkalinity enhancement. Furthermore, there's the potential for feedback. So if const rock constituents are used um, to enhance alkalinity, uh, there's the potential for those constituents to impact ecosystem that is mediating natural fluxes or organic carbon in the system. Uh, if we just exclude those factors for the moment, we can think about conducting experiments that, null that, that reduce the complexity in this ocean alkalinity enhancement um, framework to a single characteristic response curve. And here, this, this figure sort of illustrates how we might think about generating these characteristic response curves and then using the characteristic response curves as a way to um, perform MRV. So the type of experiment we envision is illustrated in panel heat A here, a single pulse of alkalinity yields a, a plume that the total uptake over that plume can be computed as a function of, of the air sea flux. And if we look at the carbon uptake with time, we see something that is a characteristic uptake curve that you can use as the kernel for a convolution with any arbitrary alkalinity forcing. Um, so an MRV system over time could involve could evolve to being comprised of a collection of these characteristic uptake curves. Um, we've done some preliminary work to map the structure of these curves using a region mask that's illustrated here. This is um, over uh, the Pacific and Atlantic basins um, in the Northern hemisphere. And these are the types of characteristic uptake curves that you get over these collection of regions for the North Atlantic 
on the top row, the North Pacific on the bottom row, and as a function of the time of year that you release um, alkalinity into the surface ocean. Um, the resultant efficiency uh, is shown here. And in these plots, um, the season again is um, by column and the, uh, the time over which we allow the system to equilibrate is illustrated in, uh, in by row. And so what we see after 15 years, for example, on the bottom row in the North Atlantic is that there's very weak uh, efficiency in the high latitude North Atlantic when uh, alkalinity is released in winter. That's a function of the deep vertical mixing mediated by convective uh, cold air outbreaks driving deep mixing in that system. Um, but the patterns um, in the North Pacific are distinct with um, high efficiency actually at higher latitudes in the Gulf of Alaska and in the Bering Sea and lower efficiency in mid latitudes um, in the Kuroshio extension region. Maps of this type can be used um, as a as both uh, a, a framework to guide uh, investments and 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 siting of ocean alkalinity enhancement deployments, as well as ultimately as we uh, gain further understanding, form the basis of a of a MRV uh, framework. Okay, just to recap that that um, uh, impulse response function methodology figure. Okay, over the next um, several years, what we envision is building Sea Star in the context of observationally rich environments, both in the con both uh, leveraging um, you know intentional field trials, deployments of ocean alkalinity or direct ocean removal, and eventually uh, seaweed farms, um, as well as uh, areas where there are intensive uh, observational arrays that enable um, strong constraints on the process oriented. Uh, formulations in the modeling system. Okay, and just to recap um, my key points, so carbon dioxide removal is required. Ocean-based CDR has the potential to scale the climate relevant quantities, but we need MRV. Um, MRV in the ocean is challenging uh, as a result of the fact that the ocean is a dynamic system, um, an ecosystem entrained in the turbulent fluid, and Seaworthy is tackling this through the application of oceanographic models and other software systems uh, to support MRV. And I'll stop there and take questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Matt. That was great. Um, really, uh, I also thought it kind of hopeful because sometimes you read about OAE and see what people are saying on Twitter and try to decipher the scientific papers. And you're like, how are we ever going to measure this? But I felt like you were You've, you've 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 created a pathway to kind of solve some of these problems so it's really really great thank you um can you talk a little bit about just to start um how you came to ocean science personally and carbon and how sort of the the origin story uh for seaworthy yeah um that's a great question so i can go back to my undergrad days when i was uh, a civil engineer and i i was learning how to think about uh in stream and in like water quality um, I started uh, learning about the systems that, um, you know, engineers use to uh, think about um, how much sewage, for example, can be discharged into a river before inducing um, uh, oxygen demand that uh, damages ecosystem. And I learned about ecosystem modeling in that context. Um, as I, you know, progressed through my career, I learned about uh, the ocean biogeochemical systems and the sort of beautiful um, hysteresis or, or um, uh, homeostasis kind of uh, phenomenology associated with large scale uh, nutrient uh, utilization in the ocean. Um, for example, the, the red field ratio is this magical thing where you, if you look at uh, the ratios of nitrogen to phosphorus in or inorganic forms in the ocean, they're remarkably similar to the growth requirements of phytoplankton. And the fact that that uh, the physical system and the biological system were so intrinsically coupled um, in the context of a dynamic climate just was fascinating to me. And so I, I really um, dug in to that space and started thinking about ocean biogeochemistry in the context of dynamic climate. That led me over time to, to come to NCAR and work on building an earth system model that represented those systems um, you know, for the purposes of, of robust climate projection. Cool. 
And NCARD um, is the National Center for Atmospheric Research? National Center for Atmospheric Research. And it's based in Boulder or? In Boulder, Colorado. Yeah. And so tell us how you met your, or connected with your Seaworthy co-founders and decided to get this thing going. Ah, great. Well, so um, first, Alicia Karspeck and I worked at NCAR for about 10 years together. Um, Alicia's background is in data assimilation. And so while I was working on building uh, the ocean biogeochemistry component of their system model, this is the, you know, the component of the model that is designed to represent the ocean's role in sustaining the carbon inventory and absorbing anthropogenic CO2. Alicia was working on data assimilation for the Earth system model, um, essentially providing the ability to pull that model so that its state is consistent with the observations, um, which is a critical thing for uh, conducting initialized forecasts. Um, she moved on from NCAR and um, uh, I independently had known David Ho, just as part of the research community, um, we ended up together at a workshop that I helped co-organize in about a year ago in September um, at Rhode Island, um, uh, Un- University of Rhode Island. And that workshop was focused on MRV for ocean CDR. And it included um, both the oceanographic, you know, ocean biochemical research community and a, a group of people from these nascent ocean CDR startup companies. And it was just a really dynamic meeting with a lot of um, thought provoking discussion. Um, The three of us came out of that meeting and um, really motivated to to think about, uh, you know, working on this problem and then kind of connected with this FRO model as the the right sort of fit. Um, Something that is, we we were pretty strongly committed to a nonprofit approach um, for a variety of reasons. One of which is just that the science is so hard and there's so many things about the ocean carbon cycle that remain unresolved. We felt it absolutely critical that our work um, be in the public domain and that um, and that a nonprofit model is the right approach. Great. Um, one quick point of clarification, MRV monitoring, reporting and verification. Um, the primary focus of what you were sharing was about measurement of the carbon flux um, and the, uh, the, you know, the carbon removal. To what extent does ecosystem safety figure into your definition of um, carbon removal? Is that part of, I'm sorry, of MRV, is that part of MRV? Is that a separate thing? Like, is Seaworthy working on that? Like, how, how does that, how, I mean, it's obviously important. Where does it fit in and how? Yeah, I've heard different perspectives on that. And I'm, I'm not, uh, to me, it's sort of a semantic thing. I think, you know, practically speaking, um, you know, whether ecosystem assessment is part of MRV or, or something distinct, I think it's an important thing that we need to be able to, to do effectively. And um, in many of the conversations that I've been engaged in with, with um, policy folks in the policy sphere, as well as um, conservation NGOs, for example, um, ecosystem impacts is really presented as a gating criteria. You know, ocean CDR will not be deployed if it is not deemed safe. And so to me, that implies that, um, it, but okay, but ecosystem impacts are really complicated. Um, you can take something like ocean iron fertilization, which people are beginning to explore again, and think about uh, what, how those, how ecosystem impacts manifest, you know, the, 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 the imagined scenario of an iron fertilization deployment in the Southern Ocean, for example, might induce ecosystem impacts that that are not really that don't really accrue for a period of, you know, let's say 30 years and, you know, very far from the point of iron injection. And so the implication is that the same kinds of tools that are needed for ocean CDR quantification, um, you know, MRV, uh, have a role to play in uh, developing appropriate ecosystem assessments and the value judgments that have to be made about, you know, whether CDR should be deployed in the context of uh, those impacts, um, you know, are sort of outside the scope of, 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 of what we do, but we can provide that information to, to decision makers. Um, and this question kind of follows. So, so, you know, everyone's all, no one's really against research. Um, or maybe even field trials, but there's some opposition to this idea of deployment. 
of Marine CDR. Um, it's a pretty fuzzy, it's a semantic question, I think, and there are some pretty fuzzy lines there. And it seems like both in terms of measurement and also uh, monitoring for ecosystem safety, certain questions will require increasing levels of scale to get answers. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you think about that issue? Where do you draw the line between research and deployment? Um, or is it not, I mean, it definitely comes up. So I think that the semantical point needs to be addressed. It may not be important scientifically, but like, how do you think about that issue? Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot in that question. Um, uh, first of all, I think it's important to recognize that um, the planet, you know, that, that, that global, global warming is a planetary scale phenomenon that's driving significant impacts on ecosystems. And so our, our sort of understanding of how things will evolve under an unmitigated climate warming scenario uh, is, is important as a con to contextualize the type of impacts that we expect. Um, and then to address you know, the, the multi-scale phenomenology of these, of, of ecosystem impacts, particularly in the ocean where, you know, processes or things that are deployed uh, locally do not, you know, the, the effects do not stay locally. They're transmitted um, within the global scale circulation and the timescales associated with that transmission are very long, decadal in, in time scale. Um, and so, yeah, we absolutely need um, multi-scale tools that are capable of representing those effects. Um, it presents a huge challenge to the ocean research community to ensure that the processes that are built into these models for making such projections are sufficiently robust. Um, and ultimately, there's a, um, there's a requirement to be able to communicate in some nuanced way about uh, how these impacts uh, relate to um, the relative state of the system in the absence of intervention. Um, and so that, you know, that's a challenging communication issue because um, so often headline, you know, headlines get get reduced to a single um, a single sort of uh, black and white point. And um, in fact, there's a lot of a lot of nuance. Um, so I, I think this is just a tremendous challenge. I think that, uh, you know, the fact that we have this burgeoning interest in ocean CDR um, is an opportunity for the oceanographic research community to really step up our game and engage in presenting science and frameworks that are um, inherently actionable um, to support decisions. And so that opportunity is a really exciting one, um, providing the capacity potentially for uh, an ocean CDR industry to grow on the basis of sound science. Um, and for science to, to provide a leadership role in, in the context of this emerging sphere in our society. Um, and then, you know, how do you think about the, or you see or the, think about the participation of, of commercial entities in this process? And specifically, many of the MCDR companies out there were formed by former or members of the ocean science community. Um, and I think all of them are well-intentioned and, um, uh, but they are commercial entities. Um, they are kind of looking to grow in scale. I think they're just physical fundamental limitations on how quickly that can happen, which I think is a good sort of implicit governance on the sector. Um, but their growth and their scaling a, with, per the current models is going to be funded by selling carbon credits. And so how do you think about that in terms of this question of research deployment? Because some of the learning is going to need to be, I mean, some of the learning will be funded by the public sector, hopefully, but some of the learning will be funded ultimately by the voluntary carbon market in some form. So how do you think about that and like the incentives that that creates? Yeah. And I, I've thought about that quite a bit and that, you know, part of our, um, you know, we, we, We've been engaged in a lot of conversations with people that are, um, you know, questioning why we 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 think of Seaworthy as a nonprofit entity. Um, one of the reasons is just to ensure that um, our incentive structure is clearly aligned with producing the best available credible science and engaging with the research community in such a way that we can leverage a diversity of perspectives and ensure that our science, you know, through peer review and transparency is indeed credible. Um, that said, I have tremendous appreciation for the private sector in the sense that uh, there is a problem solving 
um, motivating force um, in building companies and the culture that those companies sustain. And so we absolutely need that kind of energetic, um, incentive-driven uh, the actors in the ecosystem of, of, um, of entities involved with solving this, you know, solving this major climate mitigation problem. So what I think, you know, what I think that at Seaworthy, we're working with private companies, you know, part of our goal really is to uh, enable that this industry to grow, um, enable it to grow on the basis of sound science and, you know, with clear eyed view of what the trade offs associated with ecosystem impacts are. Um, and so it's actually quite, it's great to work with, with companies, particularly the subset of companies who are, you know, who, who um, believe in that ethic of science and uh, particularly in the early days are willing to share their data and recognize that there is community benefit in a degree of transparency um, that, uh, you know, that will all benefit um, in the long term from. So, yeah. Yeah, I think those are really good points. And again, I, I think that there, you know, it goes back to the question of need, needing to scale to answer some of these questions. There are just physical limitations on how quickly an EB or a Captura can build systems and deploy them and make them big. And so I think that that does provide some uh, a governor on on the scaling. Um, uh, and this this next question is not intended to be a gotcha. It's a, it's, it's a serious question, and I think it's actually a really it's a really insightful point to make. One of your seaworthy colleagues um, stated on Twitter a while back that the CDR community should be willing to say that certain CDR methods are not going to work because MRV is too hard, they take too much energy, they aren't scalable, they cause ecosystem harm, et cetera, and we should just stop considering them. We should stop investing in them. We should stop putting resources behind them. Who is we? Like, how do we make that decision focused on MCDR? And are there any MCDR approaches that in your slash Seaworthy's opinion that we should potentially stop seeking to advance now because science says, you know what, they don't work in one of these ways of not working? Yeah, I, there's a lot of nuance to that point there. Who? Um, so first of all, we are not... Um, interested in putting, you know, being a gatekeeper ourselves at, at this point in time, rather we're interested in facilitating um, the, you know, the growth of the of scientific knowledge and research infrastructure in the form of oceanographic models um, and data assimilation systems so that these determinations can be made uh, quite robustly. Um, over time, I think, you know, it is important that, you um, that we winnow the field to an extent um, if there are indeed approaches that are too hard to measure or um, cannot be deemed safe um, that you know that uh, decisions are made to um, to uh, deprecate investment in those areas and I think you know that can happen through a variety of mechanisms uh, at the core of the problem is our I, I think, you know, sort of a positive vision for establishing robust frameworks for MRV. And that's what we're really focused on in the near term is to establish robust frameworks for MRV. And then there can be sort of a natural feedback mechanism that if a particular company is selling a technology and the MRV systems are such that the uncertainty bounds include zero, right? I mean, it might even, you know, we cannot tell you that this process is net negative, then market signals themselves will will deprecate that. I think yeah. it's a, a, a fun, <clears throat> there's, a, there's, a, there's a the ecosystem impacts requires more thought because there's not that natural feedback and and it does require policy to, policymakers to engage. Right, and I do think that without naming names of specific MCDR approaches, there are certain MCDR approaches that are not attracting market interest. Um, but I don't think there has been any sort of certainly not unanimity, but like statement from the ocean science community that approach XYZ, you know what, it doesn't work. We don't know. It, there's it, there's a good chance it doesn't work, whatever the issue is. Um, and is are there any approaches that you feel like meet that criteria and that should be named at this point? Or do you think we should continue to be advancing all these different approaches? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to name ones that I think we should eliminate. Right now. All right. Um, I won't either. Um, excellent. Um, let, we have a Tremendous number of great audience questions. Um, and Irene is going to come on and start asking those. That's right. It's a very fascinating presentation. Thank you, Matt. 
Um, I'd like to start with uh, a question about focused research organizations. It's a new type of organization that we haven't seen a lot of. Um, and folks are curious, you know, could you speak a little bit about the types of organizations Seaworthy works with, for example, some of the startups that are already developing their own MRV systems, and how can organizations work with Seaworthy or incorporate some of your findings? Hmm. That's great. Yeah. So, um, so the FRO model um, is one that um, has been advanced by uh, Convergent Research, Convergent Research led by Adam Marblestone and Anastasia Gamick, um, and it's part of the Schmidt Futures Network. Um, uh, it, it ha it's reminiscent of um, ARPA, you know, advanced research project type um, entities where you have this sort of milestone driven team. Um, and what, we, what we're working on right now at Seaworthy is to articulate uh, a technical roadmap that will guide our efforts over the next several years. Um, that uh, our, our activities include um, uh, both, you know, model development, but also engagement um, with various entities to conduct research. So, um, for example, we have some federal funding right now to do an ocean alkalinity enhancement field trial in tandem with um, a modeling study. And the uh, rationale there is to um, inform our perspective on the requirements for MRV systems by actually going out and trying an alkalinity enhancement experiment and uh, attempting to simulate that experiment um, in a modeling system. Um, we, uh, as I had mentioned in the talk, are interested in building infrastructure that will exist in the public domain in and, and then inherently, uh, there is this notion of having a user community that develops around our infrastructure. And so we're keen to collaborate with people who have uh, needs, you know, questions that are they're, they're asking in this space that require tools. Um, part of our part of our reason for incorporating as an FRO is um, predicated on the, the recognition of how hard these problems are. Um, you know, having worked uh, for more than a decade uh, trying to simulate global ocean flows and the processes constraining the carbon cycle, it's really informed my perspective on the challenges associated with building robust models that can generate high fidelity solutions of the ocean system. We think that that problem is just too big for any one CDR company or even an MRV company that's trying to support a lot of different um, approaches or te technologies. Um, so our goals are to raise sufficient funding to really uh, make a large investment in advancing uh, the capacity of those kinds of tools. And that's, that's a key motivation for uh, the FRO model. That's great. Um, and we have a few questions about whether Seaworthy is hiring and what kind of roles uh, do you envision in the near term? Seaworthy is hiring. You can go to our website, seaworthy.org. And um, I think there's currently three positions open right now. Um, we plan to open some additional positions in the near future. And um, we're really excited about the very strong, we have a very strong technical team on staff now, and we're really interested in growing that capacity. Um, we're working in a very um, exciting, nimble way. And um, I and you know have office space here in downtown Boulder with um, folks coming in and generating uh, great enthusiasm. So, yeah, if you're interested in in joining us, please check out our website and, and the open okay. positions. Nice. Okay, moving into some more um, scientific questions. Uh, a good question from Laura on the timeline. Um, you had mentioned good enough is one of the criteria. What's your timeline for a good enough model and how do advancements in autonomous measurement sensors get factored into your plans? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's hard to put a, a, a fine scale point on that. Um, one of the challenges um, in this space is that building, for example, regional oceanographic models tends to be sort of a career level time investment. You know, there are people, for instance, in the academic research sphere that spend their whole careers building a, a regional domain and refining that model over a period of, of, of you know, years to decades. Um, we obviously don't have the luxury of that kind of time investment. 
Um, and so what our goals are, are to really streamline the capacity for um, uh, model validation, of course, using uh, autonomous assets as they exist um, and providing uh, kind of a rubric, a framework for assessing uh, scientific credibility of model solutions. Um, and that does not, you know, it's just a hugely challenging problem, but fully acknowledge that, um, you know, there's things about ocean modeling that are best characterized as an art, not a science, and require um, deep, deep time investment from people who have years of experience. And we have some of those people on staff with us, but as we scale the deployment of these models, you know, the challenges grow. So, our, you know, the key, the key thing we want to do is basically automate uh, what we can automate and then, um, you know, provide, uh, provide clear metrics uh, for, for model solutions so that uh, we can understand uh, how well they're doing. I wonder if you could just elaborate on that a little bit. We had um, a question that talked about, um, you know, the need to update the models based on the science as it's evolving, you know, against the timeline of a five to seven year program. Are there some priority areas that you're thinking about or are you focusing in some aspects and not others? How do you guys um, internally think about that balance? Yeah, so I should say that like our goal really is to, is to you know, focus on, um, building C star system, the, the this system as um, as infrastructure, software infrastructure that can be deployed, and you know we will work ourselves to deploy C star in particular domains, and we'll work with partners who are deploying it in particular domains. But our our goal is not to have at the end of this period of time like a global scale full deployment necessarily of of a C-Star, you know, functional global MRV system, though, you know, some of the stuff that I talked about with respect to the impulse response functions uh, may, um, may point in that direction. The goal really is to, is to establish this sort of ecosystem of, uh, of actors who are engaged um, in the use and application of this, in you know, the development and application of this um, software system. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, I think I have time for one or two more questions. Um, we have a few questions about uncertainty and how you guys think about uncertainty. Um, one is if you could speak a little bit about the current state of art on variance and the error rate in MRV of ocean CDR uh, and what your plan is to substantiate your models. I think you spoke about that a little bit. Um, and another alludes to broader changes in ocean ecosystems. So what happens when uh, ocean circulation is disrupted, for example, a slowing in the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation? Um, and, and how does that factor into your work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to speak to first the uncertainty point. So we recognize um, that the total uncertainty is um, a function of multiple sources of uncertainty. Um, one source is, you know, how well we know what we did, how much alkalinity did we introduce into the system or how much carbon did we remove? Um, another is the intrinsic variability. The fact that the ocean is a turbulent fluid it's subject to chaotic, chaotic dynamics and that uh, process implies that we cannot necessarily project predict the trajectory of the system perfectly or at least we can't pass some uh, finite time horizon. And then finally, um, uh, we have structural uncertainty. The, our capacity uh, to build models that faithfully represent the dynamics of the system is obviously highly um, perfect. And so critically in the context of developing an uncertainty estimate, we have to have an ability to address each of these sources of uncertainty. The sort of operational uncertainty, you know, what do we do can be thought of as amenable to strong observation empirical constraints. And so we have an, uh, uh, you know, we might envision that, um, that observations are deployed um, intensively local to the area of, um, of deployment of CDR. Um, intrinsic variability uh, is, um, can be addressed through running ensemble calculations that span the range of potential trajectories as the system evolves through state space. 
Um, there's a lot of nuance there that I probably don't have time to get into. Um, and then finally, structural uncertainty is a really thorny, challenging question that relates to how well our models um, represent nature. Um, and that's where uh, we have to rely on the, uh, the ability for the scientific research community to reach consensus about best available um, process representations and or gaps in the systems that we're using. And again, that goes back to our motivation for, for transparency. We imagine, you know, exposing and documenting the features of our models so that they can be critiqued um, by the community. Um, the second part of your question related to changes in climate that drive changes in circulation, and that's absolutely something that um, is a critical a critical thing to track. Um, we imagine systems to be evolving with the state of the system, um, to be you know tracking in near real time the nature of oceanographic flows um, and their response to climate variability and change. Uh, dynamics like the AMOC weakening might yield a secular trend in North Atlantic overturning. Other processes, for example, there's an El Nino developing in the tropical Pacific now, have strong impacts on regional flows um, and may drive interannual variability in efficiency uh, that's relevant to CDR. So those are things that are uh, really important to consider. All right, I don't think I have time for one more question. Um, and I apologize if we didn't get to answering yours. Thank you so much, Matt. I'm going to kick it back to Toby to close us out. Thank you, Irene. That was excellent. And to the audience, those were great questions. Um, thank you for being with us and for, for all of those um, insights. And Matt, it was really great to have you here. And um, we really appreciate your time and all the work you're doing and uh, look forward to staying in touch and, um, and watching as you guys progress. Great. Thanks for the opportunity. I enjoyed it. Likewise. Um, just a couple quick programming notes here. Uh, we have... Um, on Thursday, we have a special um, uh, webinar event on e European Union um, CDR policy. There is a tremendous amount going on right now in Europe. It's super impactful because I think Europe is sort of leading the way in terms of public sector definition of some of these questions relating to MRV. Um, there is a carbon removal certification framework period of comment that closes on September 15th that is really like, I think, almost existential to certain CDR methods that are not currently included. So we're going to talk about that on Thursday. Um, definitely relevant to uh, marine CDR. Um, and so please uh, put a link in the chat uh, to register register for that. And that will be a great conversation on Thursday. Um, in terms of this is CDR, we have another uh, interesting one next Tuesday with Philip Moss from NextGen. Um, lots to talk about there. We're going to take the 19th off for Climate Week in New York. 26, we have um, September 26, we have Eva Tom, who's going to come on and talk about all the stuff that's going on with Article 6 uh, Paris Agreement deliberations that, again, are, I think, somewhat existential for the future of CDR. Um, and that timing will be such that there will be, I think, a period, a comment period that's coming up in October and a really important meeting. So um, lots to talk about there. And we'll be announcing a number of other events soon. So uh, next week, Philip, I'm very excited for that one. Uh, we thank you for being here. Thank you again to Matt for joining us. And um, we everyone be well, and we will see you again soon. Thank you.